I want to invite our panelists on stage. Um, first, let me say that um, Trey was not able to be here, and he sends his regrets. Uh, yes, he had to go to New York to shoot a video. Um, he was very disappointed not to be here. Um, so our panelists for this afternoon, um, I'd like to bring up uh, Chingo Bling. Paul Wall. Bun B. I forgot, we kept that one a secret. We have Bun B with us today. Um, and um, also OG Ron C is gonna join us. And, and I have a really good feeling that Zero is just running late, but I cannot guarantee that. See, he's an independent man. Um, so I'd like to introduce Matt Sanzala. You already know, as they say. Uh, Longtime champion of the Houston hip hop scene, Matt Sanzala is a music festival coordinator for South by Southwest, booking hip hop for the internationally known music festival. Sanzala got his start as a music writer, penning articles on Houston rap for publications including Source and Murder Dog. In 2002, he started the influential radio show Damage Control with DJ Chill on KPFT. In 2005, he began blogging about hip hop, first at Houston Surreal and now at Austin Surreal Blogspot.com. He is a frequent speaker at conferences, including the Moshido Music Conference in South Africa. Uh, the only man for the job, in my opinion, uh, Matt is going to um, start us off by talking a little about the legacy of DJ Screw. Please welcome Matt Sansala and our panel. Thanks a lot, Julie. Well, thank everybody. Uh, thank everybody for coming out, including everybody. Damn it! It's over. Sorry. I, thank you to everybody for coming out today. This has been a really uh, incredible day for me, just to see, you know, all these years of work kind of laid out on the table here at, at the University of Houston. Like really, today we got into a lot of the history of DJ Screw and Houston hip hop in general, and <clears throat> some of the best people really uh, were, came came up for this today. I think uh, this panel though is called the Legacy of DJ Screw, and really. Instead of going into the history, we're going to kind of look at where it's gone and what it's become. And I mean, really, I think most people on the panel would agree when uh, we say the legacy of DJ Screw, we are talking about the legacy of Houston hip hop and everyone in here. Because everyone in, involved in Houston hip hop from pretty much its beginnings were affected by DJ Screw, influenced by him. He was the man who really, you know, brought it to this, uh, to where it is today. And uh, I just want to say it is really, I really, uh, if there's one thing I could wish in this world is that he could see something like this. I mean, my God. I don't know if uh, DJ Screw ever would have expected Bun B to be teaching at a university, a university to open its doors to talk about his work and the, and the uh, results of his work. Now, <clears throat> I lived in Houston in the early 90s, and I lived uh, down by the Astrodome, and a lot of my neighbors and friends, just when screw tapes first started kind of popping up, I remember the first time I heard a screw tape and I thought my friend was insane. You know, I had no idea why he was playing me a, a slowed down cassette. I really didn't get it. And honestly, it kind of took a minute for me to understand it myself. But I actually uh, moved around a lot in, after that period. Like throughout the mid 90s, I lived in New York for a year. I lived in Amsterdam for a year. I lived in Chicago. And I would take screw tapes. And it was something I, it was like a party game for me that I would like to do was like bust out a screw tape in the middle of a totally random kind of situation and uh, gauge the reactions. And like in New York, <clears throat> this was 94, the reaction was like extremely negative. Like they really didn't get it, which is kind of a natural reaction, I think, for a lot of people when they first heard screw, but I mean, they were almost offended. Amsterdam, <clears throat> you know what goes on in Amsterdam, we'd be real high and uh, Play a, mix, play a screw mix, and there might be a couple people who sort of got it, but for the most part, they really didn't get it, you know. And I, that's something I would always do when I, in my travels. I'd say, well, this is what we listen to in Houston. This is what's coming out of Houston. This is DJ Screw, and you know, it's kind of unbelievable. Now, to fast forward to today, then even just a few years ago, because it really wasn't that long ago, to see how far this music has uh, has traveled. 
DJ Screw always said it was his mission to screw up the world. I don't really think there's any way he could have even imagined how big it's gotten today. I mean, somebody like ASAP Rocky, he's a kid from Harlem, essentially released a screw tape. And he talks about how that's what he grew up on, that's what he likes. You know, to see that reach is just incredible. And I think through the work of the guys on this stage and then some, you know, that's part of what was able to help keep that alive. And I think it's a true testament to how real DJ Screw was that, you know, I mean, hip hop is not the most uh, loyal. I don't know if loyal is the best word, but culture sometimes. Like we forget, a lot of people forget their pioneers. There's a lot, us here, we may give it up to Africa Bambada and DJ Screw and whoever every day, but a lot of people don't totally always look back to the pioneers that really made things happen. And I think it's a beautiful thing that, especially here in Houston, we all, you know, you kind of can't exist in this scene without giving it up to DJ Screw. So <clears throat> with that being said, uh, on this panel, instead of me rambling and us going back and talking about things we've already talked about, I wanted to kind of get some personal uh, notes from some of these guys about their history with Screw and then also talk about where it is today. And uh, Bun, we'll start with you. I, I figured you would for some reason. Oh, man. I, I knew you'd put me on the spot first. No, this would be an easy one. This is I want to I want to ask you guys, Bun, like because you were on screw you were on screw tape. So yeah, how did you feel the first time you heard your voice screwed? Well, the first time I heard myself screwed was um, I think the first person to actually play it for me was a good friend of mine. His name is BJ. He used to live off Belmark, and uh, you know he was a real South Sider, you know, and uh, that was his thing was his screw tapes. And I, I guess before I go there, let me. Let me backtrack a little bit. I first met Screw back in, um, I want to say in 91. Uh, I was working in King's Flea Market with uh, Russell Washington, who was the guy that actually signed UGK to their first deal. Um, I told my mom I wasn't going to college. She told me I wasn't going to live there anymore. So I had to come to Houston and live with my dad. And my dad basically had like a, you know, landscaping, cutting grass, painting, torn roofs that lasted about a month and I was like I ain't doing that either so I asked Russ to give me a job in his record store and while I would be there different DJs would come through or whatever and um, you know come to see what the new music was his store was a record store by the way I don't know if I said that but it was big time records in King's Flea Market and uh, Screw was you know one of the DJs that would come through with mix tapes or whatever and I got to know him a lot and he was um, actually DJing at a club right down the street on Griggs, it was called Club New Jack, and that was um, Ray Barnett's club. And Ray Barnett is a very famous promoter in Houston who just passed away recently. And um, so I would go there and hang out, and you know, there would be dice games in the back. I can say it now because the club ain't open, nobody getting in trouble. Mm -hmm. But it used to be dice games in the back on the pool table, and they used to bring, this was before strip clubs. Y'all are very lucky nowadays in Houston for people that like to frequent strip clubs because we used to have strippers come, have to come to the after hours. I, OG probably one of the few people that know about this. We would have to try to get two or three girls to go, not me, you know, not me, you know, the person. But, uh, so, you know, just, just to give you an idea of the environment of what we were in, you know, and Screw was the DJ and he would play the different records. And I remember when he first played Mind Playing Tricks on me, because Mind Playing Tricks on me signed, dropped that summer. And I was like, man, I can't wait till he plays my record in here. So when we first pressed up our record, you know, we actually had to do what they call a test press. You guys are so lucky now, y'all have to do none of this junk. But we actually released a record on vinyl. Does anybody know what vinyl is in here? There you go, that's what one looks like. Make sure to pass that around so people can see what that looks like. But before you could put a record out, you had to get what they call a test press. That's where they test the level so you know exactly what the record's gonna sound like. When they gave it to us and we heard it and we knew this was, this was going to sound good, we gave that to DJ Screw. So I brought that to the club that night. He was the first person to ever play Tell Me Something Good anyway. He played it on the test press. And if you look inside the Ride and Dirty album cover, there's a, in the artwork, there's a picture of me, Pimp C, and Screw all standing together. And behind that, on the wall, is the actual test press to um, Tell Me Something Good. So fast forward a couple of years, and I start hanging with my guy BJ um, off Belmark. He always, he, 
he's a South Sider, so you have to say what street he's from when you talk about a South Side. So he's BJ, he off Belmark. And um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't know what I'm talking about. But um, so BJ would always have these screw tapes and he would play them and I had been hearing about it. Never in my mind had I put it together that these were the same people. And um, I was like, man, I was like, that's my song. Like, who was just putting my song on this beat? Say, man, this screw, man, I'm telling you, it's all good. I was like, it's cool, but you know, I ain't know he was doing my music, you know, keep me out of that. He was like, nah, trust me, boys like this, like this out here. I didn't understand it at first, you know? So then BJ took me to the after hours on Scott. Mm -hmm. Totally understood. Man. When you see it in that environment, in the cars, amongst the candy paint and the swingers, and candy paint swingers were not as common as they are today. You know, you some of everybody got some candy paint on Novas and, uh, you know, Suzuki's and all kinds, you know, that's, it's not, <laughs> that's not what the intention of slab riding was about, you know? But I mean, to each their own, to each their own. But um, it really represented what the nightlife and the street life of the South Side was. And that South Side, to me, uh, I mean, it, some of it still exists, but not like it was back then. There's been a lot of different things that have happened between the South Side and the North Side. And it's, you know, it's a, lot, it's a lot more open now. But this was just these guys expressing who they were. And this is before anybody was even freestyling on these tapes. It's what you have to understand, that the first screw tapes were not freestyle tapes. They were just mixtapes. And what happened was you could go to screw, you can get a mixtape, or you could pay extra, and you could screw with Shout You and your hood out on the tape, or you could pay even more and actually come in and do your own shout outs. Shout outs turned into freestyles, you know, that's where you get the birthday and all of that. That's really what people would do. Go and make a tape for this. Hey, we need to make a tape for Grace's birthday, man. We, we go all come in, you know what I'm saying, and celebrate. And, and, this, and it grew into something that is a legitimate art form of its own. No, definitely. And I like uh, that you said how well it represented the street life and the nightlife of Houston, because I've always said that there may have been bigger DJs and DJ Screw, and maybe even better, if, depending on what you're looking for. But I've never seen a DJ that really affected his community in the way that DJ Screw did. I never saw like a DJ, you know, because I've been all over Texas, and, and he he has infiltrated every aspect of Texas hip hop. Oh, without question, without question. I think um, I think it just started to grow and grow to a point where if you weren't on a Screw tape, and you was like, well, why ain't Screw and playing? You know you kind of like wanted to be a part of what was happening, you know, and, and you couldn't just get on a screw tape back then. You could pay the shout out, but you couldn't pay to get on, your music played on the screw tape. And it was all about who screw was feeling, you know, and some of it was the South, but then he used to play a lot of KB from the West Coast, you know, extensive amount of SIBO above the law, you know what I'm saying? And as it went on, he would play different, you know, especially Biggie, he, he got into Biggie, he would give Biggie a little love. He liked a lot of East Coast um, R&B, so you hear a lot of Mary J. Blige on there. Um, you would even hear uh, SWV on screw tapes back then, but you know, he, he was a DJ, you know? Bernie what, Spear. Exactly, you know, he was a DJ, even reggae, you know yeah. what I'm saying, on, on, the, on the screw tapes as well. It was just him just acknowledging the music that he liked and you know, it fit the vibe of what he was trying to represent because every screw tape had its own little message to it, its own vibe, and the music was selected to put you in the, in the mood of that. Mm -hmm. Now, Paul and Chingo, you guys are a little younger and, uh, than me, at least. And uh, I want to know, for you guys coming up, like, would you say that Screw's music was pretty much normal to you? Was that, like, was that sound when you, because you know, like I said, I went around to a lot of people who played it for them. It was anything but normal. But coming up in Houston at your age, at that point in time, was that just something that was just there, it was accepted? Yeah, it pretty much was. It, Cause there was the, the TV, you listen to videos, I mean, you watch videos on TV, you on TV rap, so whatever show was on BT at the time, Video Soul or Rap City, or, and, and then you'd have a radio, you know, and then you'd have screw tapes. And, that's where we would see the Texas music, because you didn't see Texas music on TV. You would rarely hear it on the radio back then. Uh, so we want to listen to Texas music. We had to listen to the screw tapes. But it was normal. That'd be what we preferred, because we want to listen to people who talk like us, 
who are talking about things that are relevant to us. And mostly the, the, on TV it was more East Coast and on the radio it was a little bit more West Coast. And there's some similarities, you know, we, we all share similarities with the East Coast and the West Coast a little bit, but you know, we wanted to hear people talk like us, talk about things, talk about neighborhoods we live in or that we know, and just talk about things that we knew and we saw. So that's what we would listen to it. Well, um, I just want to say that um, Screw's contribution was not limited to music. And I, I caught a little bit of the, uh, I'm sorry, it's booming. Hello, hello. I caught a, a piece of the previous panel, piece of the previous panel. And, um, and uh, you know, I think what we're all talking about is a cultural contribution. Man, what is up with this? Can I get your mic? Can you get yours? This one is cool, let's see what it's going to It wasn't mine. Thank you, Ben. <laughs> See, rappers are polite. Um, first of all, it's a cultural contribution, and I'm willing to go out in the room, and somebody please quote me on this one. But uh, DJ Screw has made the largest cultural contribution to Texas because it's not limited to music. So, for instance, when people talk about like ASAP Rocky uh, put out a CD that's like heavily influenced on hip hop, or when Paul says um, we weren't seeing ourselves on TV at the time. This was a reflection of what was actually going on. I mean, that just goes to show that a lot of times cultures are looked over, and that sometimes we, don't, we might not have a platform to put out what's really going on. So, you know, I feel that DJ Screw is present here today. You know what I mean? And I feel that even though he was having fun and, and just going with the flow, I think his message and his philosophy is something that we could all apply, which is slow down. Everybody just needs to slow down. And that's just my hippie statement of the day. I will pass the mic. Well, when did you first realize that? When did you first come to that realization? Was it, were, did you, were you thinking that way back when you were a youngster listening to this type of music? Or was it something over the years you, you realized? that I realized the impact of his cultural contribution. <clears throat> Could you see it happening back then? Well, one thing that it has taught me is I feel that, is that um, I know for a fact you and I believe what's to come next. Like, sky's the limit. Like, five years from now, there's no telling what these gentlemen are going to be doing. And I'd like to touch upon Matt Zala's introduction. His resume basically was stated, but this man is a factor down here. He's a facilitator of, of things. And I know he was the first cat to interview Paul and I for our separate, different, um, being in the magazine for the first time, my first photo shoot. I was nervous as hell. You know what I mean? So sky's the limit. Like, it's cool that we're here at U of H. It's great that Julie and everybody that put this together is, um, is keeping it real. You know what I'm saying? Keeping it true, if, if you will. And, um, and, and, and just, I mean, just real quick, I, I ramble, y'all, but the concept of trail, man, think about that, man. This is like a global concept. Like the word real and the word authentic and original has been bastardized. People don't even know the meaning no more. And, and the things Pimp C was saying before he passed, he was keeping it 1,000. He went on Atlanta radio and said, Y'all went and stole Crunk from Memphis. I mean, nobody really keeps it authentic anymore. And so I just want to commend everybody up here. And uh, the word trail, don't abuse it. it aspire towards it. Exactly. <clears throat> now we have OG Ron C on the panel as well. You're a hell of a DJ yourself. Coming up in Houston, uh, did you feel like you had to slow records down? To be heard? Actually. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Bob. <laughs> um, actually, um, it, it was a tough time, you know, really just, just to, you know, to really be all honestly, and even Paul, you know, he, he knows, you know, it was a tough time 
just for, you know, me and Michael Watts, because a lot of people at the time did think, you know, instead of us, you know, trying to help the culture, they kind of thought that we was trying to steal the culture. So, you know, we had a, you know, a hard time. So, you know, we was just trying to do it for everybody, you know, and represent, you know, just for where we was at at the time. And it ended up, you know, people taking it and, you know, growing it. The world taking it and growing it just from, you know, people taking it from Houston to, you know, you have soldiers taking it overseas. You have, you know, people taking it to college. And that's just where, you know, so it, it did become, yeah, uh, a necessity to where, <clears throat> you know, if this is the way, you know, you really want to be heard, then yeah, you know, w we, you know, embraced it also. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, to where we are. And that's the reason why today I, I, I try to do my best to keep, you know, his legacy going. Mm -hmm. Because I know it's also an avenue for artists, you know what I'm saying? I mean, like Paul can vouch, you know, it's a also, you know, a, a, a avenue, you know, bun. You know, he just, you know, explained to you, you know, him here and his record, you know, and what it did for his him and his career. So, you know, I think that it's an avenue for artists, and that's the reason why, you know, I try to keep it keep it going too, because it's not just representing Houston. It's an avenue that took a lot of artists and took a lot of us out of Houston, period. So, you know, that's that's the reason why, you know, I just, you know, I think that's that's very crucial in 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 in, in a in the game right now, so it was a necessity because I was always trying to look how to get out of my neighborhood mm -hmm. because we I had everybody we had everybody in the neighborhood it, that was you know we passed got out in the street to pass out our stuff so you know what was the next what was the we needed a new vehicle to you know to move around in and you know school made it cool for us you know what I'm saying for us to you know take our uh, just our skills as DJs and then skills as artists, rappers, and showing that they could rap also too. Mm -hmm. And you know, taking it to the world because like I said, people would come from all, I mean, you know, like Bond said, people came from a lot of, pa you know, a, a lot of places, screw music went a lot of places. So once we did realize that, <clears throat> of course, became a definitely necessity because we saw an avenue to be heard outside of Houston. Mm -hmm. And Screw had, you know, grown it that big to where it could be heard. It was definitely being heard all over the South and the West Coast. So we definitely was gonna take advantage of being heard in Dallas, being heard in, you know, Bay City and, you know, places of that sort. So when did you know. first see it spreading outside of the Texas borders? Um, actually, I came you first from college. Seeing or feeling an impact outside of Texas. Uh, outside of Texas, I would have to say um, around like ninety five, ninety six, because ninety five, ninety six. Yeah, because I, I was I went to college in East Texas in ninety two. I think I'm telling <clears throat> too much of my age right now, <laughs> but I went to college in in, in ninety one, ninety two. So. Um, when I did meet, meet uh, Watts in 94, I, I was in college, and the college I was in was a borderline between um, Texas and Louisiana, which was Wiley College, which was 30 minutes from Shreveport. So, you know, once I left Wiley, I, I knew a record store up there, and I just started sending the tapes up to the record store and just shouting them, you know, shouting out Shreveport and Marshall, you know, on those tapes, and, you know, it just bled over, you know, to Shreveport. And, and you know, people could tell you in Shreveport that they was just, you know, it was Shreveport was almost H Town at one point in time because they was just, you know, they was loving the sound too because it was just right up the street from them in East Texas. They, you know, you got Nacogdoches, Lufkin, all that little 59 line right there close to Louisiana just bladed right over. And then on into I-10 with Lake Charles and Lafayette. So, you know, that's, you know, I, I would have to say that's where it first went to Louisiana, you know, because that's where, Louisiana, you know, Louisiana, Texas, we already tight anyway. So, you know, most of the time, it, it, that, that, that borderline right there was just, you know, it bled over, music bled over right into that, that, those first little parts of Louisiana. And that's, you know, that's why I would probably have to say it started, you know, being outside of Texas, Louisiana. And then, we, you know, like the Army people too, you know, people, the, the Army, you have to, I give a lot of credit to them because in the 90s, <clears throat> I got a letter, I received a letter from Japan in probably like 98. 
you know, it was somebody that was just saying that we got your, your stuff from the army bases. So they was bootlegging the stuff on the army bases to people in Japan. So, you know, it's, it, that's when I started noticing it, probably around, you know, later 90s, mid 90s. Right. <clears throat> now, Paul, when you were coming up, one thing I always liked about you is you were, you were always kind of a jack of many trades. You, you DJed, you did all kinds of things, doing the grills, and you had a lot of contact with, you know, I know you DJed for TI at one point, you'd worked with all kinds of artists. Back in those days, when you were first starting, did you see a lot of curiosity towards Houston, or was that, do you think that helped spark? I think a lot of it, people didn't understand what we talked about a lot of times, like our slang or what we say. But at the same time, people wanted to break into our markets too, like to get fans here or maybe get accepted or just had a, the same support. So it was kind of like um, a trade-off kind of where I'd come different places and meet different people and kind of learn their culture and I'd tell them about our culture too at the same way. And most people didn't really understand it a lot of times. Some people could understand it and grasp what it was about. But um, until they start coming down, like Bun said, until you see it, until you see it for yourself, you know, then you actually can get it. Okay, this is what it's about. And that's something that we take for granted because we see it every day. But just like when we, we might hear somebody talking about some things, on, they might be from New York or California or somewhere, that we don't know what they're talking about because we've never been there. That's the same way it was for us, I mean, for them coming here because they've never been here. They didn't understand it. Um, but uh, yeah, they, it was a lot of different reasons why people would would want to be a part of it or accept it. Some people generally were fans of it and they really just wanted to hear their music screwed or whatever, or meet different artists. And that's just, my whole mind frame was always to promote the culture and help it grow. Um, I think it's part of that came from me being a DJ and I just wanted to, you know, I wanted to, I, I never thought that I would be a rapper having platinum album or any of that kind of thing. My thing was I thought I was going to be a DJ. And there's a lot of that, you know, Carol Ron C, he taught me how to DJ. So that was my goal. I always wanted to be a DJ. So I would watch Ron C every single day. We'd be at the house every single day, 24 hours a day straight, five, six, seven days straight. The only reason why we'd leave the house was to either go to McDonald's, or go get some party favors like drugs, alcohol, or something. <laughs> <laughs> I would say no, no school like that. Even then, back, back then, I was I was going to U of H, so the only time I I would leave was to come. So I I'd ride right up Lockwood and come right here to go to my classes and go right back home, and I'd be I'd be you know right here on the steps of the student center selling selling tapes and CDs, and that's the only time we. So I'd be right there watching him DJ the whole time and learning, and he he every now and then he'd have a new trick that he learned or he mastered, and he. would I just watch him, watch him. He say, "Okay, come here. It's your turn. I'm gonna show you how to do it." And he he tell me how to do it, and I just sit there for hours at a time, just trying and trying until I got to write some things I could get, some things I couldn't ever get. But <laughs> but I always thought I was gonna be a DJ. So anytime I'd hit the road, it really wasn't on. A, I'm a rapper. Listen to my demo. I'm a rapper. Let me rap with y'all. It was always on some. Man, I'm a DJ. This is what we playing. This is what I'm playing when I'm DJing in the club. Cause I also DJ in the clubs or parties. So. When I DJ, this is the artist I'm playing, these are the songs I'm playing, in different areas, I, I always would hit the road for whatever reason, and go different places, so I was on, I just wanted to promote the culture and promote other artists. I never, would never was, a, um, my goal was never to be a rapper, it was just to be really a DJ. Right. Earlier today, <clears throat> Bun, some of the folks who are uh, maybe a little older than us, actually, we, they, they touched upon how the early days in Houston, like, it wasn't that Houston rap was written out of the history books. It was never even entered into it for the most part. We didn't see, we didn't have media down here. We didn't have a lot of that attention <clears throat> that we have found in maybe the last, I'd say a little less than a decade. Right. Do you feel like the scales have evened out a little bit in, in, the, in the past few years? Have, have you seen the, the evolution of this music? Has it kind of evened things out for Houston at all? Ab absolutely. I think, um Screw helped really personify the sound from Houston. We had had examples, you know what I'm saying? Of course, the rap -a lot sound, you know, the early um, South Park Coalition records. There had been attempts by groups in Houston to try to 
you know, come together, you know, and try to send forth a message as to this is how we get down, this is what we represent. It really wasn't until I think Screw got a hold of it and put his spin on it where we really stood out from everybody because up until then, it was rap music just like any other rap music, you know what I'm saying? A lot of us, to be quite frank, in our early days, were trying to mimic either what East Coast rappers were doing or what West Coast rappers were doing. It wasn't until rap -a -Lot Records and artists like you know, Scarface, and, and especially, I really, I really like to put the finger on Willie D because it doesn't get more Houston than that. You know what I'm saying? There was no compromising himself on his, his vocal inflection, on his, you know, the pictures he took, the clothes he wore. What you saw is what you got. You either liked it or you didn't, and he really didn't give a damn either way. We took a lot of that into what we were trying to do with UGK. The whole point of it was to represent we were from, where we were from as honest as possible, and people either liked it or they didn't. We really didn't give a damn as long as PA liked it, you know? And so that's the attitude that we took forth into the world. And when Screw got his hands on it, it, it really was just like, and just so you know, this is what we do. We've, this, is, this is a way that you've never heard music done before, and it's only being done here in Houston. I remember going out to the East Coast and different places and trying to play Screw tapes for people, and people didn't even want to really entertain the notion of listening to this. This was when Tony Touch was doing 50 MCs. So it was, you know, it was a real strong time for lyrics and rapping and stuff, you know. Clue had his crazy mixtapes with all the rock people coming up at that time, you know. But it wasn't until I got a screw tape that had New York music on it. I remember I went to, I went to New York and I was hanging with, with Lord Jamar, who's a good friend of mine from Brand Nubians. And I had a screw tape that had Hypnotize on it and it had I Remember by Mary J, and it had something, I can't remember what the S SWV song was. And I remember playing them screwed up New York music. And it kind of like, like it was crickets in the room when it played at first. And it was like, yo, that's ill, son. <laughs> See, I have to, let, me, let me tell you what it's like being a Texas rapper. You can't go to New York and say you did anything because they did that already. You pop up with blunts, oh son, we were smoking blunts in 88, son, come on. <laughs> you know what I'm saying, you, even, you know, even, with, even with syrup, they swore, oh son, oh, my dad drank sip syrup, son. Y'all ain't doing nothing, we ain't done something, we started New York, we started this, son. And you couldn't say nothing about it because for the most part they was right until you put that screw tape on. And there was nobody that could say that, in New York that could say they heard that before. So that was one where they didn't have this, all New York people always have this, this, this answer to really give back to you. My New York friend's gonna give me the business for this. But it was like, ah, son, come on, son. Yeah, nah, later for that, later for that, we've been doing that. But that was the one thing that they couldn't say that they've been doing, and that was a moment where they had to acknowledge that they had heard something rap-based, hip-hop-based that they had never heard before, and it wasn't bad. Even with the R&B stuff, they were like, yo, um, they kept saying that Mary J. Blige sounded like Kenny, who was the lead singer next at the time. So it was like, yo, it just sounds like dudes singing. This is kind of ill. I could still play this with my girl. She might like this. But, but it, was, it was interesting, man, to see initially people's rejection of it because my music was rejected early. You know, a lot of people are like, who you are, son? All right, what, what's the name of your group? All right, I'm going I'm to check, check for that. Like, really, you going to check for that? I'm, I'm on a gold soundtrack, the number one sound, the only album anybody listening to right now is Minister Society, but you don't know, all right, cool. I take that and, you know, brush my shoulders off and keep going. Once Screw came, Screw gave something for everybody from Texas to stand on. I don't care if you were underground or made, you could be like, yeah, man, what you know about Screw? Oh, yeah, yeah, you know, I, I've been hearing about you, man. Yeah, you, you doing this thing. And I remember when the Just All Wars sent them out to New York. The Justo Awards, R.I.P. Justo, Justo was a DJ. And his thing was that they DJs- They were the Mixtape Awards, huh? Just, Justo Mixtape Awards. The Mixtape Awards, yeah. and sorry. But he was a DJ and he was like, you know, we need an award ceremony for DJs to acknowledge DJs and what they've done for the industry because hip hop, and I'm an MC and I can say this, hip hop is built on the back of the, of the DJ. The DJ was the star. Once TV came in, just like any other rock group or R&B group, they need somebody to stand out, and it's usually the person holding the microphone. And that's kind of what happened. 
what Justo thing was we need to ha take this opportunity once a year just to acknowledge the DJs from all over the country, not just New York DJs, DJs from all over. And I remember when they called school and told him they weren't just inviting him, but he was getting an honorary award just for being DJ Screw. And all these DJs that he looked up to, the Flexes and, 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 and the, the Red Alerts and, and all these people, man, acknowledged him for his own single contribution, something that no other DJ had done. It was a big deal for that man. They gave him a ring, I think. They gave him a ring, the, the, the plaque, man. This was a big deal for Screw One, because Screw don't leave the house, much less Houston. If you know Screw, I remember probably for, I don't know, I'm only saying for the, maybe the first six, seven years that I listened to Screw Tape, Screw didn't even have a car. That's real talk. I don't know if anybody even brought this up today in any of the other panels. DJ Screw didn't even have a car. Not because he didn't want to, because it was nothing that nobody wouldn't do for him. You go to the house and be like, man, man, what's up, Screw? You got some tears? Yeah, man, but man, I need to show one up to the Fiesta right quick, man. Man, come on, let's go. <laughs> uh, man, you, Screw, you started that tape? And I was, man, I got some punch. I ain't got no soda, man. I show up to use a blue peach knee high right now. Well, let's go. <laughs> Wherever he wanted to go, because you know when you got him back to that house, you was going to get first dibs on them tapes, baby. <laughs> and Screw was the kind of person that'd be like, hey, I'm going to slide you this one. Tell me about that Yeah, Anybody ain't got that one, you know what I'm saying? I ain't going to drop that one in a minute. Hey, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> he was one of the most soft-spoken people I've ever met in my life. He's one of the most peaceful people I ever met in my life. And I can't remember, not even, not, I even, not even mad, I can't remember Screw getting upset about nothing. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, you know personally, I, I mean, you know, every time I was around him, he had a great attitude. And that reflected through the people that he worked with, man. He made people better. You know, I could say that just by being his friend. There's a lot of people that worked with him more than I did. A lot of people knew him better than I did. So I can only imagine the impact that he had on their lives when I consider the impact he had on my life. Mm -hmm. And I was an MC with albums out before Screw Tapes. And I still got to give it up to DJ Screw. Because we was having a hard time trying to s separate ourselves. You know what I'm saying? Once Screw came in, it made it a lot easier for you to separate yourself from everybody else. And that's why everybody, either before or after Screw, still has to give him his credit, his card, and pay homage. No doubt, no doubt. Tell me this, then, if Screw was alive today and he saw things, if everything was happening in the same way, which if, who knows, people like ASAP Rocky, some of the things that have come out, the Screwed hooks on all these different songs, would he celebrate this? Would Screw be happy at what he sees right now, do you think? I, I would have to say yes. I can't see why he would be upset with other people Ex, you know, acknowledging. I think I, I don't think it's about people taking it in and using it. I think it all comes down to acknowledgement. You know, we we went through an issue, and I'm not going to name names, but I went through an issue with a group where they tried to say that they were using the world trill before they heard UGK. And I don't make a lot of big deals about nothing, but I refuse to let that slide. We refuse to let that slide because I know what my contribution is. You know what I'm saying? I don't mind anybody. You know, if you want to say that you trill, as long as you can live up to that word, use it. Don't get caught not living up to that word, though. That's just like being, a, you know, not being Greek and trying to weigh some Kappa Alpha Psi or something. Don't get caught with those letters on if you don't wear those letters for real. But that being said, we appreciate people wanting to, to you know, represent in the way that we represent it. People want to do things the way we did things. People want to, you know, follow in our footsteps like that. All that's cool. As long as at some point in the game, when people ask you, you know, where did you get it from, a little shout out is, is due. Shout out is due from me to certain people. I have to give it up to Rap Out Records. I have to give it up to J Prince. I have to give it up to the Ghetto Boys. I have to give it up to the Def Four. I have to give it up to OG Style. I have to give it up to the Convicts. These were people who were here before me. Doesn't matter what I did, if I sold more than them or if I got more famous than them, there would be no me without them, therefore. And when I see people like Rocky, these people have no problem telling you, yo, we, 
we listen to this group, man, some June 27th, they can start naming you these things. It's not a joke. It's not something that they take very lightly either. You know, they know what it means to be from not being, not, not just from Houston or Port Arthur, but not even being from Texas and trying to move around. They already knew that people was going to question it. It was like, it's all good. We represent this, and we, in our hearts, we feel that way. And I salute that. I salute that to anybody. I can't salute a, a cat from Texas wanting to do it, because to be honest, Trill is a Port Arthur thing. So once somebody outside of Port Arthur starts to take it in, we have license to get at you. Now, let me just say that. So, but you know, I'm just putting that out there. So that being said, we, you know, we've already been through this with Houston people, where Houston people wanted to say they was Trill. We ain't got no problem with that, you know. UGK, you know what it is, and nobody's ever had a problem giving it up to us. So that's cool. And me having said all of that, to say that Screw, even though he died a lot earlier than a lot of us would have wanted him to go, Screw died knowing that he had been appreciated by the people he wanted to be appreciated by, the people in his hood, the people in his city, his peers. He had gotten his acknowledgment. And to see that it's still living and still going forward, and that everybody who's associated with it do it justice, I think Screw is smiling down on us right now, talking about it already. Man. <clears throat> Chingo. Now, we all know uh, there's been some kind of funny things that have happened over the years. It's not just rap music that's been slowed down, there's been rock music and all this with Chingo. I've heard slowed down cumbia CDs at flea markets. Is that a direct result of screw music or DJ Screw's work, or is that something else? Well, um, depending on like the cumbias that were slowed down, I know in Monterrey um, they call them, I think, like rebajada, like basically like in half, like you know, slowed up. Um, so I'm really not sure because um, obviously, for obvious reasons, I don't really travel to Monterrey just because. <laughs> <laughs> but um, obviously, like, like the Chapaholics, they had a mixtape uh, called Chapa Cumbias. And I had a mixtape distribution company, and um, we, we made a lot of money together. And um, to this day, I mean, a lot of those titles are classic. And, and uh, DJ Kool-Aid, DJ Overdose, the Chapaholics, they definitely you know, pay homage and, and, you know, screw, you know what I mean? He's a man. So, um, you know, I mean, the impact is, is cross-cultural, it's, it's global, and, um, you know. Where's the furthest you've seen it reach, Paul? Or what's the strangest thing you might have seen that kind of, you can tell was a direct result of, of Houston and screw me? I mean, I can't say the furthest is reached because it's, is not anywhere that it hasn't reached. It might not be as big in Poland as it is here, but it's people in Poland that listen to Screw. You know, it's uh, huge. Or, or any any country in the world you can think of, it's somebody there that listens to Screw. We went to Africa. People, you know, is not everybody listens to Screw in Africa, but some people are. You know, Afghanistan. You know, it's everywhere. It's people everywhere who, you know, there's not one place in the whole entire world where there's not somebody there who's listening to Screw. Right. Ron C., uh, That's true. Yeah. like a similar question for you, like yeah. what's something maybe strange that someone might have approached you, a project someone might have come to you with that might have been outside the traditional realm that they wanted you to put your, your um, touch on, or a Houston feel to? I don't know, I guess the strangest thing that I, I probably, you know, just being a... Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Um, I would say the strangest thing uh, first, uh, Chingo touched on it first. Uh, the Chopperholics was, you know, like, you know, we had to give them a lot of credit for, you know, uh, taking it to another, you know, just uh, language, doing another language. And um, I think just the, 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 I've been approached by so many people to do, you know, uh, I've done, I've done, I mean, I don't know a lick of Spanish. But I've done all Spanish tapes. Mm -hmm. I've done country tapes. Uh, I've done rock and roll tapes. You know, You've slowed uh, down country? Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 I mean, you know, I mean, like I said, I mean, it's one key word in this whole thing, you know what I'm saying, that I think we miss, you know what I'm saying, that Screw said, screw the whole world up. And last time I checked, the whole world wasn't listening to rap music. Right, right. You know, so, I mean, you know, 
you can take that for, you know, people can take that for what it is, you know, if they, you know. But I've recently done uh, Thai rap. Really? Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's Thai rap is really huge in Thai. No, <laughs> no, nah. uh, you know, uh, like Thai, Thai, you know, Thailand? yeah, Thailand people, you know. oh. yeah, 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 they, they have, and if you go, um, is that like a whole album project, or, yeah, like yeah, yeah, I did, and uh, if you actually go, and, um, if you just go to YouTube right now, and type in, uh, Thai rap, you'll see that they have, you know, uh, they, they rappers, they look just like us, their music sounds just like us. They wear, you know, hip hop clothing. They wear. They look exactly like us. The only reason you would know is from the title, and even when they open, you know, their mouth. I mean, even when they open the mouth, you really can't really tell that they're from another place because it's just like, you know, you you, you could tell Adele was from, you know, you would think Adele was from right here, you know. So it's, you know, it's starting. You know, I've seen so much, you know, and like I said, I have a real big Japan, you know following so you know it's it, it's it's a lot of places like I said I you know like uh, Paul said I think that it's you know it's really it's not one plate place that we can't say it hasn't touched because I've seen it you know and I've personally had to do it myself you know what I'm saying and, and it wasn't because of somebody paid me to do it uh, it was because you know I want to see our culture go far than what it was that was the whole, that's the only reason why I'm, I'm in it right now, you know what I'm saying, it's to make sure that the culture stays, you know, here, and, and DJ Screw Legacy stays alive. Mm -hmm. You know, as long as I'm alive, it, 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 you know, I'm gonna do my best to keep it alive. So to see, you know, when it's going other different places and I can help it go other different places and people want it, you know, I, I love it. So it's, it's definitely a lot of places and you, you'll be surprised to see the different genres of music that right. is touching now, and you know, because it's uh, and you know, we working hard. You know, uh, right now I'm working hard just to make screwed music uh, its own genre. As in, you know, when you go to you know what type of music you like, and you see that, you know, what I'm saying that's where you know we're really trying to make it, you know, make things happen. And then just to uh, uh, just to touch on something Bond said about the Justo Awards before Justo died, uh, I used to always, you know tell Justo, you know, because I won two Justo Awards and it was from doing, you know what I'm saying, screw tapes. So I fought, you know what I'm saying, for a few years to have Justo to, to create a DJ Screw Award. And right when, you know, before he died, you know, he did do that. So, you know, there was, before they, you know, eliminated the Justo Awards, there was a DJ Screw Award. And just to think about that for a second, something that's from New York, and they have a DJ Screw Award. That's something from here, that's big, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So it's like, if we can keep, keep those things, you know, that's, that's the type of stuff that, you know, makes, you know, that thrives me to keep going, so. Right, well, we've, met, we've, we've called it Screw Music, and a lot of people have, but there is a big divide at least here in Houston. I think there's people who say if Screw didn't touch it, we can't call it Screw, but in 2012, as we see this legacy live on, it, it, it hasn't gone away. This music hasn't gone away. Do any of you think it's important, or either way, do you think it's important to keep his name off it if he didn't touch it, or do you think that, as was stated earlier, this is a genre and it should be given up to DJ Screw? I mean, there's an argument for either way. You know what I'm saying? I think there's an argument for, for both sides. You know, there's always going to be purists and loyalists that only want to hear certain things certain way. But then if you live in this world, you know that if things don't evolve and change with the times, then they tend to die. You know, and that's one thing that I think people that really love and respect and honor Screw is that they don't want his legacy to die. Like, can we all make the same contributions that Screw made? Of course not. It was his legacy. That's why it's DJ Screw's legacy. But the same way that I continue to contribute to Pimp C's legacy and the other artists out here continue to do what they can in their eyes and their heart to contribute to the legacy. I mean, I think you have to, you, you have to kind of make some room for that, you know? Everything can't, can't be directly affiliated. Everything can't say that it directly reflects or represents. But if things are done in honor and respect, and I don't see why they shouldn't be allowed to be a part of it, you know, but 
you know what I'm saying, everybody, everybody can't be screwed. And I think the people that try to continue the legacy aren't trying to be screwed. I think they're just trying to keep something that a lot of people around the world have fallen in love with, something that the city has been identified with. You know, if we, if we let that movement die and go away, then it's gonna be very hard. I mean, we're gonna be starting from the ground up. And I haven't seen anybody from anywhere, you know, cut off, you know, anything. You know, Easy E is dead. They still make it gangster rap in L.A. You know what I'm saying? Big E is dead. You still got lyricists in New York. And, you know, Screw is dead. Rest his soul. But I don't see why we still shouldn't have DJs doing slowed up music in Texas. That's not. Nah, that's just my personal view. And there's. There's definitely going to be people that don't agree with that, but I'm a big boy. I can handle that. You know, people ain't like me before. They won't like me tomorrow. It's all good, but you know, like I said, it's that's easy for me to say. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people who are a lot closer to Screw who may hold this a little bit dearer to them, and it may be harder for them to let go of Screw. I have no problem with that. I have no argument with that. God bless you, and I guess everything will happen in its own due time. But we can hold on to the past all we want. The world keeps spinning. I will say that. Do you guys pause? Yeah, please. I, I, I want to touch on that right quick because, you know, it, I did catch a lot of flack at first, but like there, there, DJ Screw is the legend. You would never, nobody could never, you could never copy that. You could never, even if you wanted to, even if I set out and tried, to be like DJ Screw. I couldn't be like DJ Screw because DJ Screw was one person, his own person, his own man. You know what I'm saying? Now, with this, you know, what we're trying to do now, such as I can speak for some of the younger DJs. I can speak for the younger DJs that's, you know, I applaud those younger DJs because they have the passion that Screw had for his music and they have a passion that they want to keep Screw's legacy alive. So that's a, that, that's a reason why I gathered most of those young guys who I saw and I thought, you know what I'm saying, that wanted to keep the, the legacy going, to help you know, me keep the legacy going. That's the reason why I created the Chop Stars. Mm -hmm. Because I want, it to be gone, I want it to be going on when I'm dead and gone. When I'm dead and gone, I want somebody, I'm, I made sure, I took up on myself to make sure that even when I'm dead and gone, I'm not gonna wait for nobody to sit and try to uphold it. I'm gonna make sure that I create it, that I'm taking the steps. And that's what, we, and that's what we're doing with the Chop Stars is that those are the younger guys that love DJ Screw. They came up, they was, right now, I could say they was probably born, you know, off of DJ Screw's music because it's 20 years you know, that it's been around. So definitely, I can say that some of these guys that, that's in the Chop Stars, they was born during the DJ Screw era. So for to them to see, for them to have so much, you know, enthusiasm about it and want to be a part of and to keep our and to see our culture and DJ Screw's legacy to continue on, it was overwhelming to me. So I feel like I was in a position that I needed to, to help the legacy keep going. And that's the reason why right now that we're trying to keep it going. And I know, yeah, a lot of people don't like it. And you know, and we don't, you know, say, you know, I, I mean, I've actually, you know, you know, a lot of people don't like it. I don't even need to go, you know, this farther than that. But a lot of people don't like it. But at the end of the day, I do honestly, truly think that in their heart, they see that we're trying to keep something going here. And you know, it's like when you're criticizing it. Just step back and ask yourself, what do I do to make sure that it's going on? Don't criticize the next person, just make sure that you're doing what you're supposed to do to help it keep going. You know what I'm saying? We all, guess what, Pimp C, it's like Pimp C right here, because guess what? We all keep Pimp C going. We all keep it going, we all keep Pimp right here. It's like sometimes, like when I be riding, I feel like pimp be right there with me because this is like it's like, dang, you know what I'm saying? Because of just nobody wants Pimp C's legacy to die. Nobody wants UK legacy to die, so you're gonna always hear it. So you you can't be mad about you know somebody wanting something to always be there. So with that being, you know, 
I'm pretty sure it's a, you know, it is a few DJs in here that I know, you know, that do uh, slow down music. So, you know, I, I like to, you know, be the one to say, I encourage them because we need it because I'm not going to be here forever. Michael Watts not going to be here forever. So we want to make sure that people know what DJ Screw did for us. Artists, rappers, all kind of people he did stuff for us. Just not about the music. Like Chingo said, he's gave people a lot of way of life just from, from you know, even if you go talk to a person like Ernest who paints cars, he made a living just because of the culture that Screw made cool. Paint candy cars. Now, it's a man out there that's, <laughs> you, you understand what, how big it is? It's just not music, like Chingo said. Paul Wall, grills. You know what I'm saying? It's a lot of things that stimulated from this culture. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, we, we, we need to do, we need to keep it going, and that's exactly what we're trying to do with the Chop Stars and OG Ron C. You know, and also I can speak for my brother Michael Wise, who's not here. You know what I'm saying? That's what we do. We, you know, we trying to keep our H Town thing going that DJ Screw started and pioneered and created, and we just trying to keep the legacy going. For sure. Now, Paul, I know you were, you know, when coming from the Switcher House, from what, from my memories, you were one of the first people to really work with screwed up click members. I mean, not, I mean, from your side. Say what? Like, like early on, like when I remember in those days when you first started doing songs with Lil Kiki or any of the screwed up click members. How did that feel for you to come? Did you feel like you broke down certain barriers? Uh, I don't. Or that the, the, like I, mutually I mean, broke down. I barriers? probably have a different opinion because it's me, but. I've always been just a big fan. So Lil Kiki, me coming, growing up on the north side, I remember being in junior high and high school, and you know my best friends, one of them was from Hiram Clark, one of them was from South Park, and the other one was from Acres Home. And me, we'd all ride together. <laughs> we'd ride together, and every now and then, my homeboys from the south side would put in a screw tape. And my homeboy from Acres Home, my boy Ernest, would take it out every time and throw it out the window. And he'd be like, man, we don't play that in this car, man. We the north side, this, you know that. But I'd be, I'd be the undercover screwhead, like, damn, man, why y'all, man? You know, because I, I was an undercover screwhead. Yeah, it, it was, you know, there's a lot of people like that. Um, but uh, so I was always a fan, even to this day. Lil Kiki's my favorite rapper. He always was my favorite rapper. I just loved the way he rapped. So when I was in a position where I could do a song with him, or all the people who I grew up admiring. They were my heroes, Bun, you know, Kiki, and the list goes on. But when I have an opportunity to rap, when you have an opportunity to rap with your favorite rapper, some people's favorite rapper might be Lil Wayne or Jay-Z or whatever, but my favorite rappers were the Screwed Up Click, UGK, and that's it. You know, So if I had an opportunity to rap with them, it's a dream come true. I, take, I, hold, that, I hold that to the highest utmost as if, Somebody trying to come up gets to do a song with Jay Z. You know what are the odds of that? You know, up and coming rapper. You know, even no matter how many albums you sold, not too many people get to do a song with Jay Z. So that's how I feels when I do a song with somebody from Screwed Up Click or with you, you with Bun or Pimp C. That's how I feel. Like I really feel that way in my heart. So, you know, I, I never really looked at it like I was breaking down barriers. I just looked at it as, man, I can't believe I'm getting to do a song with my favorite rapper. You know, so it, when we in the studio the whole time. I'm listening, watching, you know, I'm like, damn, I can't believe I'm talking to my homeboy, man, you, man can you believe, man, we gonna be in the studio with us right now, man, can you believe that, you know, <laughs> even now, you know, it's just how it is, and, and I just take notes for what they do, how they do their delivery, how they write, everything, because I want to better myself, so I see what they do, and I take notes, and it's just, and it's an experience, so just being able to be in the studio or around somebody, you know, we, people who have grown to become my friends, you know, now they're my homeboys. Now we were homeboys, but even at first, even now, I'm still a fan. You know, so it's just I never really looked at it like as if I was breaking down a barrier or any of that. It just was, uh, man, I can't believe I have this opportunity to rap with my favorite rappers. Someone today actually cited you on a panel as if you ever want to place a, a sample from DJ, a DJ Screw Tape. If you ever try to figure out where a sample came from, you ask Paul Wall. <laughs> I don't know, man. That's a tough one. Don't put me to the test. Yeah. No, who did this? I don't know all of them. I know some, but not all. Definitely, right. it's, it's too many. At this point in time, like compared to even just a few years ago, do you still think, as a Houston artist, or in general, but as Houston artists, 
do you feel as though it's essential to release a slowed version of your product project? I, I would love to talk. To I, would, I would love to jump out on this one. When we sat down to do Riding Dirty as an album, Riding nobody really even knows this type of thing. Riding Dirty was originally created to be a studio album that felt like a screw tape. If you listen to Riding Dirty, a lot of the songs, the tempos are slower on Riding Dirty. If you look at the artwork for Riding Dirty, we are literally in front of DJ Screw's house. That's the Botany Boys jacking us in front of Screw's house. That's the whole theme of the album. We went to Jive Records in 1998 and asked them to do a chopped and screwed version of the album. We told them Screw would do it. All we have to do is bring it up. You know, bring, all you guys got to do is put it out, and we guaranteed them that they would sell more copies of it. They wasn't buying it. They they didn't understand half the half the stuff I was even talking about. They never really they never really bought into UGK because we was from the south. They never really thought that what we were talking about people on a national scale would get a hold of. You know, we made songs about syrup. They told us that kind of thing it wasn't promotable. It wasn't that. I understood that. You know, I, but that being said. There was a lot of things that we tried to tell people the world would love and appreciate if we would just, if you could just give us a chance to really show them. Rotten Dirty was the best way we felt we could try to promote what was happening in Texas at the time. So you have songs that are real slow, like Diamonds Up Against the Wood is a perfect example. It's a studio song meant to literally replicate the feeling that a screw tape gives you. He worked very hard on trying to do this, and it was things that we talked to Screw about. Screw knew this, and this was all about trying to get this, as we say, out there. Just trying to get that movement out there. And, and you, you fast forward, and now it's, you know, it's, it's almost a rite of passage. You know, I got a call um, this week, you know, from, from an artist that wants to do a slow down version of their record. You know, man, I want to get with you, and, your name always, my name and Paul and Slim, oh man, I wanna get with you and get with Paul. They either call Paul first, they call me, or they call me first, yeah. and then they call, follow me to put you up, but you know what I'm talking <laughs> yeah, about. Yeah. People wanna be down with this, so we should have no shame in representing what we do. Everybody from here should be proud of DJ Screw, you know what I'm saying? Um, you know, I think he made a good point about the, 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 the soldiers going from city to city, country to country, I remember getting a call at two in the morning. My friend Dizzy Rascal had just landed in New Zealand. And I say, you know it's two in the morning, you know I'm an old man, why are you calling me at this time of night? I ain't got no show, I'm not nowhere getting paid, so I'm asleep, what do you want? He said, man, I just landed in New Zealand. These dudes just picked me up in a can to paint a Cadillac with an Algiers UGK for Life shirt, bumping a DJ screw mixtape, and I just had to call you and tell you. You know, and, 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 and that's what it's all about, man. You know, I'm, I'm still surprised when I go to places and people know what I do. You know, thanks to Matt, I've been able to travel the world and do a lot of music, man. And I've been going to countries that literally just within the last 20, 25 years got to choose what they wanted to listen to. Up until then, for generations, they were told what music to listen to. They would, they didn't even get a chance to change the channel. The channel was there, you just watched what came on or else you cut the TV off. Well, now they're getting a chance to listen to anything they want to listen to, to be a part of anything they want to listen to. And if you go to any of these countries, these Eastern European countries, the Eastern Bloc, as they call it, right now the number one music in all these countries is South music. Once people finally got a chance to listen to all rap music and differentiate between what they felt spoke to them, they chose what we doing. And a lot of that got to do with screw. Just keeping it 100. Or trio, as Chico brings up. Love you to put it. Right, so we are, we're getting close to the end here. Um, and in closing, I'd like all of you to comment on this. I'd like to know, and, and this has been touched on already, but what do we as a culture of artists, fans, music business professionals, what do we owe DJ Screw? Everything. We wouldn't be here. None of us would be here. I mean, there's some things like, some things are destined to happen, but there are people who, who make things happen for you and open the door for you and things like that. So, you know, but we wouldn't be, 
the road to success is a hard road, but DJ Screw made it a hell of a lot easier. Man. So I mean, we wouldn't. We, I wouldn't be here at all. I, I would not be here rapping. I wouldn't be selling grills. I wouldn't be doing anything I'm doing if it wasn't for DJ Screw. Man. Man. Tinga. Whoa. Well, for one, um, I'm, I'm going to go about the answer uh, quickly, but in a roundabout way. Um, a lot of times, I'm the only brown dude on the panel. Um, so I'm, I'm very humbled and very, you know, very honored to be like the Richie Valens. Well, Richie Valens was the rock and roll. I always get lucky some kind of way and, and slide up like somebody feels it's a good idea to include me in something. So whoever those people are, thank you for your open-mindedness and your curiosity to allow the little Mexican guy with the cowboy hat to speak. <clears throat> and uh, of course, you know, we got like my, my brother Lucky Luciano, you know what I'm saying? He's a beast. Um, you know, we got Screwed Up SA representing, um, you know, SPM. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. Um, right. So for one, that's pretty cool because, um, you know, screw, come on, you know? Um, but the question was, sir. What do we owe him? <laughs> I just couldn't leave without, at but forgive me. <laughs> I couldn't leave without at least acknowledging like why Chingo was in the MTV thing, why Chingo always get lucky. And so I'm very grateful. Um, and just going back to open-mindedness and curiosity, I think people that, that judge Screw's contribution as an art form, like, like the guy, for instance, I don't know who created dubstep, or who created uh, Mumbaton, I, you know. Dave but, Yeah, I know, actually, I do know who created Mumbaton. But what I'm saying is, <laughs> I call myself right when you said it. You know, you got three vowels, you got all these different experimental sounds, and Screw is the creator of, of this experimental sound as a genre. And um, so what I'm trying to say is, open-mindedness and curiosity is what's gonna prohibit somebody, let's say, um, not to keep picking on New York. Let's say a New Yorker who is like, yeah, 10 years ago, like, man, I don't get it. So, you know, salute to Screw for um, representing us and putting a true reflection to our lifestyle and our culture because ultimately our culture does tend to get vultured from time to time. And I just feel like, like everyone has been saying, we just need to do our best to be proud of who we are, where we come from, the eyes that we've seen things and, and just use that as inspiration and take that to do whatever it is y'all choose to do. Amen, hallelujah, church, tabernacle. Yes. CCD. Oh, yeah. um, I, I, me personally, I feel like, you know, I owe um, everything to DJ School because I was, I was not into mixtapes. You know, uh, Michael Watts put me into the mixtapes, so. I was into, you know, radio. I used to be the radio dude. And, you know, I was young. I thought radio was the way. You know, the, the way is the truth. I did, you know, Michael Watts instilled in me that, you know, radio wasn't the way. And that, you know, <clears throat> I was just a DJ. I did, you know, parties and stuff. So I, I wasn't really too much into mixtapes and into the, you know, just being hardcore out down the streets like that. But, I think, you know, we owe, every, I personally owe everything to school because right now I wouldn't be nowhere near none of this, you know, if it wasn't for DJ Screw having this brilliant idea of slowing down a record, you know, and making it cool to listen to and ride around and listen to. Because people think you slow down a record right now, you know, that's it's cool, but you got to go listen to a Screw tape so you can know what this is about. It wasn't just about slowing down a record. You know what I'm saying? It wasn't. So if you go actually listen to Screw music and his tapes, you will see that it was way more, uh, you know, what he did. You know, he made it real cool, you know what I'm saying, to be able to, just like you said when you first heard it, man, you thought, what the hell is this? You listening to this, what the, I think everybody, you know, can say that our parents or somebody who said, man, is your tape broke? As you know, especially back in there, you, back in the day when your tape player did get, when you ran the hell out your tape on, when you played this, yeah, when the battery rolled down, rolled down, or when you would have rolled the shit out that tape. When it got that 
take the stress so much and stuff good for it. You know what I'm saying? Everybody thinks so. Yeah, you know, now nah, Screw came and he made it cool. Made that cool. So, you know, with that being said, I owe Screw everything. And that's another reason why I have to say every time I get a chance to open my mouth, I make sure that people know who created or who made it cool to listen to anything under 33 and a third. You know what I'm saying? So, I mean, for y'all that don't know, that's what our music is recorded at, 33 and a third. <laughs> but, you know, and, and he made it cool for that. So, you know, I, I'm always, you know, pay homage and pay respect to DJ Screw because without him, I would definitely would not be OG Ron C at all. No doubt, no doubt. <laughs> When I think of what I personally owe DJ Screw, I'm a rapper. I don't know if y'all knew that. Um, but rapping is bragging. Rapping came off with playing the dozens, capping on people, whatever you want to call it. That's what rapping is. In the beginning, you bragged about your skills, because that's what we all were trying to see, who had the better skills. As we started making money, we you know, started rhyming, you know, rising in society, those were the things we started bragging about. I got a Beamer, well, I got a Benz, well, I got a Bentley, I got the Phantom, yeah, I, you know, I live in a mini McMansion, I live in big house on the hills, you know. But then we all got that, so now we're getting back to, you know, bragging rights. Well, what is it that you have that I don't have? For me, the one thing that I got that they don't got is DJ Screw. That's a hell of a bragging right to take anywhere. You're gonna win a lot of them with that one. When I think about what we owe DJ Screw, it's what's happening in this room today. A conference acknowledging, the, as, he, as Chingo said, the cultural impact of DJ Screw. He was more than just a DJ that spun records. It was much more than that. You know, and, and any DJ will tell you that. And we, I want to thank, personally thank Jude for what they've been able to put together here at this university. Yeah, thank you, Jude. Because that too, is what we owe DJ School. And, you know, some of us, you know, one of you guys out here, you know, could very well be the next person that impacts Houston's, you know, hip hop or, you know, political or legal or business. You know, DJ School didn't just do this so that everybody could be a DJ. He just did this so that, you know, because that's what he wanted to do. He felt it in his heart and he stuck with it. And I think that's what we should all take away from screwing his legacy. Don't let anybody tell you that what you're doing, that you feel in your heart is right, is wrong. Because they could be stopping you from being the next screw. So I want you to take that with you. Whatever it is you're trying to be in life, try to do it the way screw did what he did in life. Don't do it for the money, because he didn't do it for the money. I don't know if anybody ever said that. On any of these panels, it was not about money, because to be very honest, Screw was supposed to die a millionaire. He didn't care about money, he cared about his friends. All these dudes he had coming to his house rapping for him, not one time did he try to put a contract in front of these people's faces to sign these people. Not one time did he try to exploit what he and his friends were doing. He tried to keep it 100 for the side side. So if you represent DJ School or trying to represent DJ School, make sure that you keep it 100 like DJ School kept it 100. And shout out to Wicked Cricket because he was the first person to give DJ School a DJ job. And if he hadn't gave that man that opportunity, he might not have even stand up, Wicked Cricket. Please stand up. If this man had not given School an opportunity to be a DJ, he might not have been the DJ that we know him to be today. So hats off to you, my brother, and remember, keep it, keep it true and live your life screwed up, baby. No doubt. I think that's a great way to end. Shout out Wicked Cricket. What's up, baby? Well, I think that's a great note to end on, and I want to thank everybody involved today. Definitely want to thank Julie and the University of Houston for everything they've done for putting this together. If you haven't gone over to the library yet, you definitely need to check out the archive that they've got over there. There's some incredible pieces that... I, I haven't even seen before, as a matter of fact, which I, I was kind of surprised. Some of the photos, there's not a ton of DJ Screw photos floating around, and she found, she's got some real special ones over there. Yeah, it definitely, was before the camera phone age. Yeah, exactly. So, so definitely uh, take some time to, to check that out. 
and I just want to thank all of you for coming out here and you know really giving this event uh, a great audience, a great chance, and I hope this can happen again. I learned about Houston and recognized there was something about life in Houston that was similar to life on the east side of Buffalo, New York. Lots of similarities. I learned so much from these artists. Hip hop is global. It's a rich, thick story and history that runs through Houston, but you already know that. That's why you're here. But the question is this, what about the folks who come after you? What about folks 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years from now? What will they know about this story, this history? At Rice, we've been wrestling with this question on our own. The University of Houston's been wrestling with this question. And a little while back, Julie and I got together and thought it made absolutely no sense for us not to wrestle with this question together. We couldn't let a highway separate us in that way. There was just too much that we could do together, a certain type of energy, a synergy that we could milk for the benefit of a larger community. And so we decided the way to get at this question and to make certain that folks 50 years from now, 100 years from now, know what we know about hip hop in Houston, the way to do that was to develop an archival system, an archive of real materials that told the story of hip hop in Houston and to make this available to everyone. You don't have to pay tuition at the U of H or at Rice to have access to these materials. So we're hoping that you'll do this. When everything's online, you come and check us out at both campuses, check us out, pay attention to these materials and make certain that you tell the story. Thanks so much. Thank you, Dr. Penn. It has been a pleasure to work with you, and I hope that uh, mitigates the fact that I sort of butchered your job title. But <laughs> OK, it's all good. Um, so as you would not turn off a screw tape uh, before the end of all the shout outs, I hope that you will stay for a moment while I thank all of the people uh, who helped me put the conference together. Uh, it's very great to be thanked by Bun B and our, uh, many of our panelists, um, but I definitely did not do this alone. So I'm going to read them real quick. Um, I should read them really slow, but I'm going to read them uh, quick. Uh, Marilyn Myers, Andrea Malone, Carolyn Meanley, Liz Mullane, Rachel Vasek, Jay Fisher, Renia Butler, Bree Edwards, Nicole Laurent, Anthony Pinn, Andrea Matthews, Maya Rain, Mako Fenil. Uh, and this group included people from University of Houston, Rice University, and TSU. Um, I'd also like to thank people who weren't officially on the committee but should have been, Pat Bozeman and Lance Scott Walker. Um, I'd like to thank So South, uh, the digital distributor. Many of you may work with them. Um, so the reason So South is here is um, because Randy Haga, that one of the owners, um, started with me when I started working to reach out to the hip hop community. He said he wanted to be involved, and um, he got me in touch with some people. So they have been a real collaborator. Um, I'd also like to thank all of the staff who helped you get signed in, helped you get wristbands, um, and all of that. Um, so, uh, there are some people I need to recognize too. Um, Papa Screw left early, um, but he has been wonderful, and that's for him. Um, I've also worked with uh, DJ Screw's cousins, Big Bub, Big D, Lil D. Are they still there? I, I kind of feel a little like they're my cousins now. Um, and I want to recognize um, also a special woman who I just met today, but uh, Mama C is here, Pimp C's mother. Yes, she's, she's here. Um, and I've worked, with, I've worked with all kinds of people throughout the city, uh, people I never would have thought I would have met um, and worked on a library project with. Um, but the people who have really gone above and beyond, I have to say, um, Papa Screw, Misha Hawkins, Lil Randy, DJ Chill's been a huge help too. And um, also online, um, I really want to thank um, my buddies at the screwshopforum.com. Um, and I, I especially want to thank them for not being as sarcastic to me as they are to each other. Um, so the, um, the 
events don't stop with the conference. Um, tonight, uh, over at Rice, there's the 2012 college DJ battle honoring the legacy of DJ Screw. So we've, we've heard from a lot of um, DJs and about DJ Screw um, coming up. So we can go out to this and support DJs from different universities in the region um, who are uh, coming up themselves. Um, that is from 8 to 11 at the Rice University Student Center. Um, DJ Chill is a special guest DJ. Um, the host is Zinn, celebrity judges Bobby Fats, uh, DJ Ebonics, DJ Mr. Rogers, DJ Superstar, Carefree, I don't know how to say his name. Um, <laughs> but um, So please go to that. That is also free and open to the public. Um, I hope you had a wonderful time. My last shout out is just to the Houston hip hop community in general um, for being so welcoming, um, so, embr so just embracing the project, um, helping me so much to do this, to do this uh, conference. Thank you very much.